Eco Africa is often about having ambitious goals and trying to make a difference. And today is no exception. In the next 30 minutes, we'll introduce you to projects and people working to conserve the environment. Welcome to Eco Africa. I'm Chris Alems from Lagos, Nigeria. Hello Chris, happy to present today's show with you. My name is Sandra Twinovdia from Kampala here in Uganda. Here is the overview of today's show. How tiny radio transmitters make life easier for farmers in Burkina Faso. How aquaculture in Turkey is changing the Black Sea's marine habitat. How activists in Israel fight fast fashion with nature. We start our show today on the island of La Reunion. The French territory is located east of Madagascar in the middle of the Indian Ocean. La Reunion has set itself an ambitious goal. By 2028, the island wants to completely rid itself of the fossil fuels and also switch all of its energy production to the renewables. Eco Africa has taken a look at what progress has been made so far. Reunion Island is famed for its beautiful beaches and lush green mountains. But when it comes to carbon emissions, the island's record is less attractive. Around two-thirds of its energy needs are covered by fossil fuels. This heavy oil factory in the city of Le Port is run by French utility EDF. In future, it's due to switch to largely carbon-neutral operation running on colza and soya oil. Just one step towards achieving an ambitious goal, switching to renewables completely by 2028. This power plant owned by Albioma runs partly on coal from South Africa and partly on domestic biomass. It will need to switch completely to biomass in future. The sugar refinery next door at least provides a convenient source of the green fuel. We utilize as much of the sugar cane as possible. We press the liquid out of it and the sand and earth caught in the cans gets distributed on the surrounding fields as fertilizer. The molasses go to the ram distilleries. The Albioma power station uses the plant fibers to produce energy that flows into the public grid from which we then draw our electricity. The Albioma power plant accounts for around 11% of the island's overall energy output. The conversion to all biomass production is costing the company 200 million euros, and that's just for this one plant. These are our two new storage domes. They have a capacity of 9,500 cubic meters each. These are the kind of units we mainly use. We plan to use sustainable biomass that meets European Union standards. We'll initially use wood pellets from the United States, but we'll later switch to suppliers closer to home, like in Mozambique and South Africa. Only 10% of the wood pellets will be sourced from the island. That means 900,000 tons a year will need to be imported. The company says it will still cut the plant's overall carbon footprint by over 80%. But environmental activist John claude Futaza says importing wood is not a sustainable solution. Of course, these factories need to be converted. But we also need to build up our domestic production of biomass. That will be better for the environment and create more jobs. Futaza built this house a few years ago. It's equipped with solar panels and a solar boiler. So I'm just making tea. I'm heating the water with solar power and the herbs are from my garden. The house has built-in ventilation so it doesn't need air conditioning. It uses only a third of the energy that is old house required. So he has surplus electricity that he sells to the public grid. 
He says many more homes could be converted to solar power without great expense. Donc là, je vous amène pour voir effectivement des maisons. I could show you plenty of houses that still don't have solar power. If they all had solar panels and a solar boiler, that would already cover half of the island's energy needs. On pourrait avec uniquement le soleil satisfaire à plus de 50% les les besoins énergétiques de l'île. So far, the government is more interested in large-scale solar farms, like Les Cedars, a 9 megawatt project in the south of the island. Here, fruit and vegetables are grown under the solar panels, which provide the plants protection from the hot sun. This is a small island. We have to make good use of space for new buildings, farmland and power plants. So here, we are combining a solar power plant with an organic farm. We also have a battery system that stores the electricity produced during the day to feed it into the grid at peak times. The company plans to expand this model and multiply its solar output sixfold. That would be another important step towards achieving the union's goal of covering all its energy needs with carbon neutral renewables by 2028. It would be good if more regions followed La Reunion's example. If carbon emissions continue to rise unchecked, the Earth could warm up by 5 degrees in the next 100 years, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That would have catastrophic consequences. That's right, Sandra. Here in Africa, farmers are already struggling with climate change, periods of drought, extreme heat, no rainy season, to cope with the difficult conditions, what's needed is knowledge. In Burkina Faso, there is a project that uses unusual means to pass that knowledge on to farmers. At first glance, Bama is a village like many others in Burkina Faso. But it's also part of an ambitious pilot project aimed at bringing helpful information to the country's rural regions. Here, smallholder farmers can use their phones to access radio programs that feature agricultural information in four local languages called Transmission Air et Terre. The program airs practical ideas and suggestions to listeners. Thanks to this radio show, I learned how to utilize fertilizer pellets better. We found out about the Pocket FM channel and learned how it works. We really appreciate it. And the best thing is that with just a few clicks, you can call up and listen to older programs. That is a great feature. The technology behind it is simple. Farmers can call up programs free of charge via portable radio transmitters. It doesn't use up data volume or require a SIM card. All that's necessary is to be within a specific 6 kilometer range. The radio station Bama Pele, one of the project partners can be listened to in the middle of rice fields. Some of the programs can be accessed later on demand by people unable to listen to live broadcasts or by those who don't have radios. Time behind the microphone is given to farmers but also to agricultural experts. We talked about preparing the soil for planting and also about the distances that farmers should leave between the waterways and their fields. We also discussed the use of pesticides and their effects on the soil and the negative impact on plants. The project is not a one-way street. The producers regularly meet with farmers' representatives to find out which topics are of interest to them. These farmers will welcome programs about seed or fertilizers that bring higher yields, but also protect the soil. Those who've heard about new and interesting innovations tell us about them. They're also in contact with specialists from various fields. They very often suggest we talk to people who have special expertise on certain topics. So, the group here in Bama has a major influence on our program. The devices come from a project partner in Germany and are financed by the German development agency, GIZ. 
The program targets regions with poor or no radio reception. We piloted Pocket FM in Bondukwe, Bama, Diebugu, and in the Cascades region. It was so successful that we want to introduce Pocket FM in the rest of Burkina Faso in the coming weeks and months. In the future, video clips should also be available, even without an internet connection. The team is currently shooting one about vegetable diseases and how to treat them. But regardless of how multimedia it becomes, Pocket FM will continue to report those issues and need nearest and dearest to the farmers, just like it has always been. Using resources responsibly, that's the aim of the activist you're about to meet in our next report. In Israel, fashion designers have found a striking way to draw attention to the amount of waste that's produced by the industry. Here is this week's Doing Your Bits. A cape made of bags and packaging with a box as a hat? Just folly or is it fashion? These colourful outfits were made by artists, but it's only at second glance you see they're actually made from trash. Like this bubble wrap wedding dress, complete with veil. And how about this funky blazer, a slew of cigarette butts? It's actually quite awful because there is a, a stinky smell. And also you can imagine that all those butt was on the beach and on the street and it's one of, it's the most common uh, trash cigarette butt. This artist's group in Israel is holding a mock fashion show in Tel Aviv's harbour to protest the damage fast fashion wreaks on the environment. The fashion industry is a major culprit in harming the planet, especially fast fashion cheap items of clothing that end up in landfills after being worn just a handful of times. Even a simple cotton t-shirt needs nearly 3,000 litres of water to produce. And every year the fashion industry generates over 1 billion tonnes of CO2, much more than the aviation industry. These Israeli activists think people should know that. We're here because of the fast fashion problem, all the issue with trends that people go after and they just buy and buy and buy and the clothes go to third world countries that they burn them and they put them in the ground and just creates a lot of pollution. There is no reason for us not to buy secondhand clothes, to use what we have. Their message is clear. Fashion can be fun, but it's even better to make it sustainable. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Sustainability is key. The United Nations has declared 2022 the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. It's calling on fisheries to be more careful and conscientious in their handling of resources and ecosystems. And that's exactly what's lacking, as our next report from Turkey shows. Goethe Eran is once again off the coast near her hometown of Sermene, past underwater pens for fish farming in the Black Sea. Together with fisherman Ömer Saral, the environmentalist is on the lookout for new fish farms. Here in northeastern Turkey, where jobs are scarce, this is a promising new industry for many. There is one over there, and there is another one. One kilometer further along, they spot buoys. Later, fish cages will be fastened to them. Erhan says more bad news for the Black Sea. The fish inside these overcrowded cages quickly become ill. Fish farmers use massive amounts of antibiotics and other drugs to counter this. This damages the entire marine ecosystem. 
çevresindeki doğal ekosisteme de zararı oluyor. Marine biologists all over the world also warn that excrements and food leftovers from aquacultures harm smaller marine animals. What's more, when diseased fish escape from their cages, they endanger the healthy marine life around them. MS Aral depends on healthy fish to make a living. But that is becoming difficult because fish farms occupy the habitat of native fish species. They are installing cages in the last remaining spawning grounds where we catch fish. Fish stocks are already decreasing. Last year, there were no mackerels and no whiting. Instead, young salmon are released into the pens, a species not normally found in these waters. Aqua farms are booming in Turkey and exporters like Ilker Yildirim want to share some of the profits. The amount of fish farmed in his hometown of Trabzon alone has increased 50-fold in the past 10 years. Yildirim, who has customers as far away as Japan, rejects the criticism expressed by environmental activists like Erhan. Our aquacultures are more environmentally friendly than anywhere else in the world. We only operate them six months a year because the water is too warm for salmon during the summer. And the authorities closely monitor us. Besides, we have noticed that our cages are attracting other fish species and that helps the fishermen. But Erhan says that Turkish authorities do not monitor marine conservation efforts closely. She has spent years fighting against a vast garbage dump near her home village. The case made international headlines. German filmmaker Fatih Akin even produced a documentary about the dump near the coast. Then the dump was covered in soil. Toxic runoff, however, still flows into the sea. Erhan says the entire area is an environmental disaster waiting to happen. This area gets a lot of rain. The dump could slide away or explode from the gases building up inside. And then, in mid-October, Erhan's house burned to the ground. The cause of the fire is not yet clear, but she isn't ruling out arson. İnsan orada iş kapısı alacağını düşünerekten. I'm told again and again I simply don't want people to earn enough money by farming fish. Or they tell me I'm pushing a foreign agenda when I oppose the rubbish dump. But my house is right next door. Why would I not be voicing a personal grievance? And when I look out to the sea, I don't want to see any fish farms. Since the fire, Erhan's mother is now worried. I don't want her to be harmed. It can't be ruled out anymore. But Erhan won't be intimidated. She wants to rebuild her house and make it a meeting place for environmentalists. She wants more people interested in the Black Sea, which experts say is under serious threat of suffocating by wastewater from neighboring states. Erhan cannot understand why the authorities are allowing aqua farms to further harm this ecosystem. How can you destroy the planet you inhabit just to make a profit, even just for a month's salary? This should be keeping people awake at night. Goethe Erhan refuses to accept things as they are, but for the time being she is fighting a lonely battle here in Turkey. I have great respect for that woman's courage. It takes determination to stand up to poachers. That's what one NGO in Cameroon did. What's more, they've managed to turn poachers into conservationists. That is right, Chris. Conservationists in Cameroon's Igbo forest have made it a reality. The rainforest is one of the world's largest and is almost unsurpassed in terms of the different animal and also the plant species. Now, despite the threat of deforestation, there is hope for this unique environment. This rainforest can only be reached on foot. Jean Titier and the Ebel Forest Research Project team are on the lookout for rare primates. Oh, look, that's a gorilla's nest. They usually build them on the ground. 
After their evening meal, they make themselves a place to sleep. We have 11 primate species here, including gorillas, chimpanzees, drills, and Preuss's red colobus monkeys. The primates are in high demand with poachers who can sell them as bushmeat. Jean Titil also used to make his living that way. But for most of the last 10 years, he's only studied their tracks to find out which animals are traveling where in the forest. He lives in Ibuti, on the edge of Ebu Forest, one of the three villages that are taking part in the project. I have grasped what impact poaching has, and anyway, it's not really a profitable business. Okay, yes, you can earn a bit, but the income is very irregular. That's why I decided to stop hunting. Usually, now, he only gets to see the animals in video footage. The researchers have set up 17 trial cameras in the part of the forest where gorillas live. Besides chimpanzees and gorillas, these forest elephants are also threatened with extinction. And the extremely shy drills are particularly at risk. The Ebel Forest Research Project was set up by the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, which supports primate conservation. It's been collaborating with the villagers for more than 10 years. Many of them used to be poachers. Now they've learned to collect data on the animals or set up camera traps. Anyone who wants to take part must join a gorilla guardian club. Then they get paid for their work. We have to thin out the clearing a bit so the camera isn't obstructed. Once a month, the team spends a few days venturing deep into the rainforest. They use compasses and GPS to find their way. Marcel Ketchen has been part of the team for nine years. The environmental scientist records precisely where each animal trail is found. What's particularly interesting are the movements of the around 25 gorillas that were discovered here in 2002. Up to then, there were only two known gorilla subspecies in Cameroon, one group living south of the Sanaga River and another hundreds of kilometers away to the north. So the reason why we, we are collecting these samples is to do some genetic analysis to find out where, how related the gorillas of Ebo are to those found south of the Kasanaga and the Cross River gorillas. Ebo Forest in southwestern Cameroon covers an area of almost 1,500 square kilometers and borders on Nigeria. It is part of a large rainforest region, the second largest worldwide after the Amazon in Brazil. To protect the rainforest in the future, the project aims to include the residents of the more than 40 villages surrounding the forest. The three villages taking part in the project so far all have a gorilla guardians club. To enable the residents to feed their families without having to resort to poaching, they can join the local club. Here they get help to buy livestock or plant vegetables or cocoa. Like here in Iboti, there is a small school in the other two villages on the edge of the forest. The teachers receive training from the scientists, and protecting the forest and its animals has become a fixture of the curriculum. What kind of animal is that? A gorilla, ma'am. The idea is to raise awareness about the topic among the youngest villagers. What I like about the course is the gorillas. They are like people. And what I learned is that hunting isn't good because animals are like people. The project has made many of the villagers see the forest with different eyes. Like Jean Titil, some 90% of the one-time poachers have become farmers. And that's what the children see while they grow up. But the Gorilla Guardians clubs don't want things to stop there. We want a no-go zone to be created, in which the measures to guarantee the survival of the gorillas are respected, because the species is in danger of extinction. That's why he only takes his children to the edge of the forest. Look here, this trail. 
What animal left that trail? A porcupine. He wants his children to know about animals, but he also wants them to know when to leave the forest to its inhabitants. We hope you enjoyed the show and like members of the Gorilla Guardian Club, may always walk through nature with your eyes open. Goodbye from me, Sandra Twinobrio, here in Kampala, Uganda, and see you next week. Thank you, Sandra. If you want to know more about our echo issues, follow us on our social media channels. All the best from me too. I am Chris Alem saying goodbye from Lagos. Uh -oh.